I think people are still joining, but um, I guess I'll, I'll make a start. Um, hi, everyone, uh, and welcome. Um, my name is Nathan O'Donnell. I'm uh, currently writer in residence at Maynooth University. Um, and this is the, the third event in a public program, which I'm organizing uh, as part of this residency on experimental publishing. Um, I want to say thanks at the outset to, uh, to Maynooth University um, and particularly to Una Frawley, um, who oversees the, the residency program there um, within the English department, um, and also to Kildare County Council and to Lucina Russell. Um, it's really been a brilliant opportunity uh, for me developing my own work, but, but also exploring and presenting some of uh, what I think is, is, is really the most interesting research and practice that's, that's going on in this wider field of experimental publishing today. Um, before we start, I do just want to, to, uh, to, to speak a little bit about what I mean by experimental publishing and to give a, a slight introduction. Um, it's a, it's a pretty wide ranging term, but I think at its most fundamental, it really refers to the work of, of practitioners and projects that use publishing as a site of experimentation. Um, it includes work that, that expands our idea of what publishing, as in the act of making public, can be. Uh, it also entails, in many cases, a critique of the conventions and politics of literary publishing. Um, with the associated ideas of the author, the book as commodity, the literary marketplace, the literary marketplace, um, and importantly, also I think there's a, a critique of copyright that runs through this this field that um, and animates this field in in, in interesting ways. Um, essentially, yeah, what experimental publishing does is is lay out some alternatives. I think um, it's a field that crosses disciplinary boundaries and artistic forms exploring and forging new approaches to the act of making public and it spans things like artist publishing, uh, political and protest publishing, underground publishing, uh, Samizdat and zines for instance, um, and also the, the wider field of post-digital publishing, um, which I think is, is, is a, a, what uh, we'll be focusing on this evening. Um, yeah, it involves a whole range of strategies and processes. Um, it includes practices, that embrace collective, collaborative, provisional, political, anonymous or participatory processes, uh, which in different ways uh, disrupt the received conventions of publishing, of the book, of authorship. Um, it happens in both print and digital forms. And I, I do think the revived interest in, in experimental publishing in the past decade has to do with the questions that the expansion of post-digital publishing has raised about copyright, creativity, uh, piracy and so on. Um, and I think it's something that tonight's speaker is going to explore uh, and does explore in her work in, in a number of really fascinating and rich ways. Um, so tonight's speaker uh, is Yannicka Adema, uh, who is an assistant professor in digital media at the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures, Coventry University. And in her research, she explores the future of scholarly communications and experimental forms of knowledge production. Her work incorporates processual and performative publishing, radical open access, scholarly poetics, media studies, book history, cultural studies, and critical theory. She explores these issues in depth in her various publications, but also by supporting a variety of scholar-led, not-for-profit publishing projects, including the Radical Open Access Collective, Open Humanities Press, Scholar-led, and Post Office Press. Um, and she's currently co-PI on the community-led open publication infrastructures for monographs project, uh, COPIM. Um, her monograph, Living Books, Experiments in the Post-Humanities, uh, will be out with the MIT Press in 2021. Um, so I'm really delighted to, to uh, welcome Yannicka tonight. Um, we'll keep questions to the end as in previous uh, events. Uh, these can be logged if you like using the, the chat function, but we will just hold them till after uh, the talk. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, I think I think at this point I'll just I'll hand over. Um, Yannicka, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to, to the presentation. Thank you, Nathan, also for inviting me and for everybody who's made it to, tonight, this afternoon, uh, for my talk. I'm just going to share my screen now. Hopefully that will all work. Can everybody see this full screen now? Yep, that's great. 
Okay, so today I also want to start talking a little bit about my own research around experimental publishing, um, which uh, focuses mostly on the importance of experimenting with alternative ways of thinking and performing scholarly books or scholarly publications. So as part of my research, um, I explore the potential of experimental forms, practices, relationalities and institutions of publishing. And I show how by cutting the book or publications together and apart differently, and by exploring experimentation as a specific discourse and practice of critique, how these publishing ventures have the ability to challenge and rethink the material conditions under which humanities research is being produced. So for many of these publishing projects, some of which I will discuss today, experimenting is an affirmative and a speculative practice. So it's a means to re-perform and create, creatively reimagine the relationalities that make up publishing, as well as our existing scholarly institutions and practices in potentially more ethical and responsible ways, exploring more inclusive forms of knowledge and opening up space for difference and otherness beyond our fixating and totalizing conceptual and knowledge frameworks. So for instance, by experimenting in an open way with the idea and the concept of the book, but also with its materiality and the system of material production surrounding it, we can ask important questions concerning authorship, the fixity of the text, quality, authority, ownership and responsibility, issues that lie at the base of what scholarship is and could be. So to explore this, my work looks at experiments in scholarly publishing with new forms of processual, living and remixed publications, anonymous and collaborative authorship and publishing, performative publications and radical open access publishing. So I argue that when we start to understand publishing as a complex, multi-agential, re relational practice, the question becomes how to better foreground the various agencies involved in knowledge production. So some of my most recent thinking around experimental publishing has been brought together in the two publications here on this slide. So there's my forthcoming book with MIT Press, which will be out by the end of the summer. Uh, and on the left, there's a recent co-authored processual aversion report for the COPIM project, uh, which situates experimental books within the context of scholarly research and publishing. And it includes a typology of experimental academic books, as well as a selection or a section on tools and workflows for experimental publishing. So do check that out if you're interested. So I want to start off by introducing some of the concepts and ideas that I use in my work. Um, so in addition to experimental publishing, which I've shortly introduced just now, these range from post-publishing to processual publishing. And I will illustrate these concepts with examples of some of the publishing experiments that I've been involved with. So in the second part of this talk, then, I want to come back to the topic of today's talk, so post-publishing in pandemic times, uh, to discuss two publishing projects initiated during and in response to the pandemic. Although perhaps not apparent at first sight, I want to make a case for why we could see these projects as examples of experimental or post-publishing and how the backdrop of the pandemic has made visible some of the ongoing issues around the humanist, commercial and object-focused tendencies that continue to dominate scholarly research and publishing. So I want to start off with saying something about the concept or idea of post-publishing, which is related to the post-publishing program of Symposia that I've been running together with Kaya Marcheska at Coventry University. Uh, so more information about this program is available via the link in the slide, uh, which leads to the post-publishing website. And you can see an example of the previous symposia and speakers that we have invited here on these posters. And I'm hoping to actually pick up this program again later this spring uh, in a virtual form this time with a few additional symposia. So also keep an eye out for those. Um, and I'll be uh, announcing those when I've got more information. So within the post-publishing program, we've been exploring what publishing means in an increasingly online environment, where publishing has become in many ways instantaneous and something that in principle is no longer limited by traditional gatekeepers. So researchers more and more share in-progress work on blogs, websites, on social media and in collaborative documents. So talks, papers and lectures so showcasing new tentative research ideas and pro projects are taking place online these days and tend to be recorded and made publicly available. So, so perceived final versions of research in the forms of published articles are also increasingly published dig digitally and openly too, making it easier for research to be updated, versioned, commented upon and reused. 
In short, you could say that increasingly scholars are getting accustomed to sharing their research in a public setting as it develops. So with the demise of these traditional gatekeepers, such as publishers, and the introduction of new ones, such as digital platforms and service providers, conventional distinctions between publishing as the activity of making information available to the general public and research are increasingly blurring. Where increasingly research is being made public as part of the various stages of its development. So in this context, publishing as an activity becomes less about making public where emphasis starts to lie increasingly on the diverse and multiple reasons for why we publish. For example, for communication reasons, to receive feedback, for impacts, for career progression, etc. So in other words, the blurring boundaries between research and publishing have contributed to a raising awareness of when and why we publish and for what reasons, and in what instances we decide to cut our research down or it is cut down for us. So in this environment, the choices that we make for where to publish become ever more important. For example, do we publish in a printed book or on a wiki? Um, whilst at the same time making us more aware of how the form of our publications is inherently shaping the publication itself and is an active agent in how it is produced, disseminated and consumed. So if we take this as a given, we can see how publishing is inherently implicated in research and in many ways part of the research process, again, further breaking down these barriers between research and publishing. So given the above, if we imagine a future in which the distinctions between publishing and research are indeed increasingly eroded, in the sense that we will increasingly make research publicly available as it develops, if we then perceive publishing as something that becomes, and in many ways always has been, an integral part of the research process, as something which happens at various stages of a research process, then what does publishing imply in this context? What functions does publishing fulfill beyond making public? What is a publication if we publish various outtakes or versions of a research project as it develops and is taken up further by others, potentially? So these are some of the questions uh, that this program has explored uh, through a series of seminars and through interviews with uh, scholars and artists, which you can find on our website. And this is an image of Eva Weinmeier, who I think will also be presenting next month in this uh, program. Uh, so definitely tune in for that one, too. Um, so, yeah, the next concept that I would like to illustrate is that of collaborative publishing. Um, and I want to do that by the example of the Radical Open Access pamphlet series, uh, which were published by Post Office Press in collaboration with various presses within and allied to the Radical Open Access Collective. So the Radical Open Access Collective is a community of 70 plus presses, organizations and projects involved in scholar-led, not-for-profit, radical and experimental publishing practices. So in 2018, I organized a second international conference on the ethics of care, which consisted of seven panels divided over two days and promoted critical discussion about creating a more diverse and equitable future for open access. So the conference was community driven and was co-organized and co-curated by members of the collective. To highlight the collaborative nature of the event, as well as the experimental forms of publishing that the collective promotes, I devised the collaborative speed publishing project around the conference, producing seven pamphlets, one for each panel, each edited by the member of the collective curating the panel, and all made available in print and in open access online via the Humanities Commons core repository ahead of the conference. So this speed publishing project uh, was initiated and overseen by Post Office Press, or POP, um, which is a scholar-led experimental and collective press and research project. So POP functions as a ghost press, uh, so a press that can be taken on by anyone who wants to publish under its name, similar to a collective name such as Anonymous. Meaning that the press is an open, shared and collective brand, project or name, which offers academics and scholar-led presses a platform to present, disseminate and provide authority to their experimental publications if they wish to do so. So the pamphlet format was chosen for this publishing project given the, its historical importance as a media to rapidly communicate political ideas. Um, as such, pamphlet has been instrumental as print media and bringing about political change and being a rapid format, this enabled us to have the pamphlets with the conference papers available both online and in print during the conference itself, enabling further interactions with the content of the papers online. 
So the pamphlets were custom designed and retail printed and co-published by Birmingham-based Rope Press, which is a charitable organization supporting artist publishing. So Rope Press printed the pamphlets in a limited edition print run, uh, which were sold at low cost during the conference. So central to this project was to highlight the collaborative and non-competitive nature of the publishers that are part of the Radical Open Access Collective, in contrast to the commercial and proprietary practices of the large commercial publishers dominating academic publishing. So each pamphlet in this series was collaboratively published and branded by three entities, by POP, by Rope Press, and by the Radical Open Access Collective member respons responsible for editing or curating the pamphlets and the panel. So the pamphlets were published in CC BY or NC Share Alike, depending on what the press wanted to do. Um, and the authors and editors or publishers share uh, copyright. So as these have been published in collaboration with the other press in the collective, they were able to add their curated and edited pamphlet or the series as a whole to their own catalogs. And the design files were also shared with them to enable them to do extra print runs of the pamphlets and to republish them if they want to do so. So this experiment exemplifies my interest in the kind of political potential of collaborative forms of publishing, where the benefits of the Radical Open Access Collective's philosophy to share with other members in a horizontal, non-competitive manner, meant that it was easy to collaborate and cross-promote each other's publications, widening the reach of the pamphlet substantially, where each of the seven presses or publishing projects were promoting a series. In addition to this, the pamphlets were also included in the Radical Open Access Collective or Scholarlet Bookstand, um, which is an open source, collective, non-competitive bookstand and conference presence, uh, which was set up for the first time during the second Radical Open Access Collective conference and has traveled worldwide since. So the pamphlets have been an important part of this bookstand, displayed both in print and available digitally as part of the Book of Books uh, USB device, which we also uh, exhibited as part of the bookstand, on which all the books from the collective being open access are available for rapid transfer to attendees' computers. So during the pandemic, uh, the book stand was again reimagined as a virtual book stand, which also includes the pamphlets. And so you can find the virtual book stand via the link uh, here on this slide. So what I basically want to highlight through this project is how not-for-profit presses, repositories and academics working together to archive, brand and disseminate research, um, how they could function, how, how this could highlight the collaborative and non-competitive nature of scholar-led radical open access publishing. So the next concept I would like to illustrate is the concept of performative publishing. Um, so to illustrate this idea of performative publications, I would like to highlight an article that I submitted to a special disrupted issue of the Journal of Media Praxis, um, which I co-edited. Um, and this article can be seen as an experiment in versioning. So as part of the original project, or more precisely the project in its first instantiation, which was a website and several posters, um, these were created to together take a different take on the article, the political nature of the book on artist books and radical open access, which was written by myself and Gary Hall and originally published in the journal New Formations. So this article um, explored issues of access and experimentation in publishing by comparing and contrasting developments undergone by the artist book in the 1960s and 1970s with the changes academic book publishing is facing as part of its current uptake of digital and open access publishing. So we argued there that access and experimentation are crucial to any future of the scholarly book if the critical potentiality of the book is to remain open to new political, economic and intellectual contingencies. As such, we profess the need for the material, conceptual and cultural constitution of the book to be reviewed, re-evaluated and reconceived in an ongoing man manner. So what I, together with many collaborators, subsequently created was a practical adaptation and in many ways a continuation of the argument made in this New Formations article in the form of a performative publication which reflects on the praxis, ethics and politics of academic publishing. So a performative publication wants to explore how we can bring together and align more closely the material form of a publication with its content. 
So the term performative publication uh, was coined by Christopher V. Long, who defines it as a publication in which the mode of publication performs one of the central ideas the text itself seeks to articulate and explore. So performative publications focus on how the mode in which we produce, disseminate and consume text influences the content and meaning of the text or the way we interpret it. So here the accent lies more in the material agency of publications, not merely investigating their own materiality, but actively performing it. In this respect, this project wanted to emphasize that we should have more in-depth discussions about the ways that we do research. So how can we ensure that throughout the research process, we focus on the medial forms, formats and graphic spaces in and through which we communicate and perform scholarship, as well as on the discourses, agencies and institutions that shape and determine our scholarly practices. So the argument made here is that this contextual discussion focusing on the material materiality of our textual scholarship and its material modes of production is and should in not in any way be separate from a discussion on the content of our work. So the main objective of the project was to turn the original article in New Formations, which focused on the correlations between artist books and open access publishing, into a version that would itself be accessible in various forms and which, similar to an artist book, would experimentally reflect on its own nature. So focusing on alternative reading paths or contexts, which offer the reader more choice on how she or he can access the text, both on and offline, was key here. In addition, by having different versions of the text available to interact with, we also wanted to focus on the different kinds of engagement these provoke to their specific material and technological affordances. So the website that we subsequently created, uh, which as a whole comprises a performative publication, consists of three sections, each offering an alternative way to engage with the article or to access and or distribute it. So the first section of the website consists of the text of the original article, which is what you can see here on the slide, which offers a familiar linear reading experience. The second section of the website consists of 28 keywords, which relate to some of the main themes and topics that characterize and structure the article's contents. So access, process, medium, object, etc. These keywords are connected to snippets of text extracted from the original article that relate to that specific keyword. So when you click on one of the keywords, either on the main page or highlights in the article, you will be offered an alternative non-linear thematic route through the article, hopping from snippet to snippet of text. So the third section of the website provides an offline engagement with the article. It consists of seven posters that can be printed off at home, each containing four keywords and four connected QR codes. So the QR codes next to each keyword will direct the reader to the corresponding keyword on the website, offering them the availability to access the previously described text snippets via their mobile devices. And on the back side of each poster, you can find all the seven posters in a reduced size with their accompanying keywords and QR codes. And the poster can then be folded in such a way following the provided folding instructions that it forms a little hybrid booklet consisting of all the miniature posters. So to then extend this with in a way a fourth and a fifth version, the article for the Disrupted Journal of Media Practice focused on performative publications and was itself at the same time a performative publication. So written in Hypothesis software, this article hinged upon specific aspects, fragments and concepts of the original performative project that it engages, entangling the community's engagements along the way. So making use of Hypothesis, which is the annotation software that you can see on the site here in this slide, uh, the web version of this article has been written in the margins of the performative publication that it reflects upon, entangling itself with this project at various points. So the reflections written in Hypothesis extend the performative publication both theoretically and practically by examining the correlation between performative pub publishing and technotext, from Catherine, a term from Catherine Hills, uh, performative materiality, a term from Joanna Drucker, and literature, which is used by Pfeiffer. Uh, and feminist design, so Tara McPherson's uh, concept. And the ethical and political challenges towards academic publishing these kinds of concepts and practices pose. 
So the web version of this article stresses the collaborative and processual nature of scholarship, where through a hypothesis, the wider community interest in this subject, consisting of both annotators and the peer reviewers, have become active participants in this involving publication. And you can still add to this now. So if you would like to further comment on the project or on the article, uh, you can do so via hypothesis. Um, so the evolving publication is both open-ended in time and collaborative in authorship. So for the print version of this article then, um, in the Disruptive Journal of Media Practice, the designer reproduced the layered and interactive aspects of the article using markers and differences in font sizes. What you can see here on the slide too. Um, so to come back to this idea of performative publications and if performative publications are the material expressions or incarnations of specific research projects and processes, Entangled with them are various other agencies of production and constraints, for example, technological, authorial, cultural and discursive agencies, to name just a few. So what I want to argue is that performative publications as a specific subset of publications actively interrogate how to align more closely the material form of a publication with its content. In other words, where all publications are performative, they are all knowledge shaping, they're all active agents in knowledge production, not all publications are performative publications in the sense that they actively interrogate or experiment with this relation between content and materiality, so kind of similar to artist books. So yet in addition to this, there's also an openness towards the ongoing interaction between materiality and content, which includes entanglement with other agencies and material forms and, constra and constraints and possibility. So finally, I would like to zoom in on the concept of living books or processual aversion books. So that those are books that are either openly editable and or that are regularly updated and versioned online. Um, so the idea of living books, I'd like to exemplify through the Living Books About Life book series, uh, to which I contribute a co-edited book on symbiosis. So Living Books About Life was a groundbreaking series of open access books about life designed to provide a bridge between the humanities and sciences, uh, which was published by Open Humanities Press from 2011 onwards. So all the books in this series repackage existing open access science related research, supplementing this with an original editorial essay to tie the collection together. So this project was designed to, among other things, challenge the physical and conceptual limitations of the traditional codex by including multimedia material from videos to podcasts and even whole books in the living books but also by emphasizing the book's duration by publishing using an open source wiki platform. So these books are themselves a living collaborative endeavor, open on a read-write basis to add to, to edit, to annotate, translate and remix. So here the thinking is that wikis as a tool, a technology or a platform offer the potential to kind of question and critically engage issues of authorship, work and stability. Um, and so here the hope is that they can offer increased accessibility and induce participation from contributors outside of our often closed academic circles. So what both the Living Books About Life and Open Humanities Press earlier Liquid Books project share is a continued theoretical reflection on issues of fixity, authorship and authority, both by its editors and by its contributors in various spaces connected to the project. So these discussions have among others taken place on the blog that accompanied the Living Books About Life series um, and in the editors Holden Birchall's multimodal text and video based introduction to the Liquid Book series to give just some examples. And the argument is that it is in these connected spaces that continued discussions are being had about copyright, ownership, authority, the book, editing, openness, fluidity and fixity, the benefits and drawbacks of wikis, quality and peer review, etc. And it's very much also on this discursive level um, that the aliveness of these living books and the living books project has been further ensured. So these books live on in continued discussions on where we should cut them and when and who should be making the incisions, taking into consideration the strategic compromises, uh, including, for example, in the living books about life project that they had to add a frozen version and a book cover and clearly identifiable editors um, 
just to emphasize that these are actually books published by press. So these kind of compromises that we might have to make due to our current entanglements with certain practices, institutions, and pieces of software, all with their own specific power structures and affordances. So within a wiki setting, questions concerning what new kinds of boundaries are being set up are important. So who moderates decision over what is included or excluded? For example, what happens with spam comments? Is it the editors? Is it the software? Is it the press? Is it our notions of scholarly quality and authority? So what is kept and preserved and what new forms of closure and inclusion are being created in this process? How is the book disturbed and at the same time recut? It is our continued critical engagement with these kinds of questions in an affirmative manner, both theoretically and practically, that keeps these books open and alive. So at this point, I would like to return to the current predicament that we find ourselves in uh, and the impact that the pandemic has had on scholarly publishing more in general and how it has made visible some of the continued issues underlying scholarly knowledge production. So to just really quickly summarize, um, one important development has been how the closures of universities and libraries as part of various national lockdowns emphasize the importance of digital and open access publishing uh, with many publishers and presses temporarily making their collections available openly online for scholars and students uh, locked out of their institutional libraries to access. So the pandemic also highlighted the ongoing rise of Amazon, uh, where with the closure of bookshops, our reliance on this commercial book distribution giant increased even more. The lockdown and homeschooling also again emphasized the unequal distribution of care responsibilities, uh, where women published or submitted significantly less papers during the various lockdowns, for example. The pandemic also highlighted the importance of the speed of publishing to, for example, get biomedical research out as soon as possible, which saw a rise in the publication of preprints and also the coverage of preprints within the media, which has been quite interesting to think about how we establish quality and authority uh, within scholarly publishing, how this is changing in context of uh, emergency. So within these kind of ongoing developments, of course, there's many more that uh, I, I haven't highlighted here. Um, I would like to highlight two projects that directly responded to some of the challenges the pandemic posed to our systems of knowledge production and dissemination, while directly intervening in and questioning our publishing institutions and conditions too. Uh, so this is, these are really my first reflections. It's still a work in progress. So um, I'm really keen also to hear what your thoughts are on this. Uh, so the first project I would like to highlight in this context is a syllabus published by my friends and colleagues from the Pirate Care project. So flatten the curve, grow the care is one of the instantiations of Pirate Care, which is a transnational research and publishing project, as well as a network of activists, scholars and artists who stand against the criminalization of solidarity and argue for a common care infrastructure. So co-organized by Valeria Graciano, Tomislav Medak and Marcel Mars and their co-creators and collaborators, Pirate Care do this through an engagement with the syllabus form, uh, which is based on the underlying open source sandpoints publishing infrastructure and workflow, uh, which I will describe more in detail in what follows. So the Pirate Care syllabus is in essence a collaborative writing project an ex ever-expanding work in progress that grows through collaborative writing sessions with activists and artists engaged in pirate care, with the aim of activating collective learning from their practices. So pirate care documents grassroots efforts and offers practical guidance and inspiration for care and mutual aid collectives, combating the major issues posed by the pandemic. And as you can see, some of the topics of the syllabus are on the slide. Um, so the collective of creators see what they do as a, and I quote, collective note-taking effort to document and learn from the organizing of solidarity in response to the urgency of care precipitated by the pandemic. In this sense, flatten the, care, flatten the curve, grow the care, documents at the same time supports the wave of solidarity and mutual aid organizing around the pandemic in times of lockdown and current quarantine. The notion 
uh, the notes or documents that make up the syllabus were collectively written and translated into German, Italian, Spanish, and Croatian, for example, by the transnational network of pirate care practitioners. And in this sense, the syllabus had a two-part goal of both sharing resources and insights on how to provide an organized care during a pandemic, while at the same time helping to articulate demands and providing alternatives for life after the pandemic, where, as the collective argue, going back to normal forms of capitalism, patriarchy, racism, and environmental breakdown is simply not an option. So the way pirate care has been conceived and produced means that both the syllabi and the workflows created can be adapted and adopted by other initiatives. In this sense, the project supports both local community responses as well as worldwide care initiatives. So from a publishing perspective, this project is interesting in myriad ways, beyond the focus on collaborative writing, crowdsourced translation and reuse and remix of existing resources, the underlying experimental publishing workflow or technological framework is based on the same principles the project argues for. So the open source online publishing platforms and platform and software are called Sandpoints, developed by Marcel Mars, it was what allows the collaborative writing, remixing and maintenance of the catalogue of textual materials and knowledge and learning resources, resources that Pirate Care is building. So Sandpoints can store and organize texts in ways that are stable, easy to access and free and open. And as an infrastructure, it enables the collective editing, revising and publishing of online syllabi, and it has been specifically designed to be used and adopted by others. So the notes and documents that make up the syllabi are written in plain text markdown files, which can be rendered or processed into a static HTML website uh, by Hugo, which is a static site generator, from files in a Git repository or version control system. So from this repository, the syllabus, as well as the collection of knowledge resources, can be versioned and forked and can easily be translated into various formats from automated output to HTML or website, to print quality PDFs, exhibition format prints, and USB drives. So the knowledge and media resources, which are predominantly publications that the syllabi references, are also stored in shadow libraries connected to the project. So the Pirate Care project shows how real life processual publishing done in a communal setting has the capacity to perform care and solidarity through acts of publishing in a post digital setting. Where Sandpoints has been designed in such a way that syllabi can also be printed and distributed in various forms and formats adaptable to times of crisis. In this sense, the publishing technology underlying, underlying pirate care is one of the practices that the project supports and argues for. It is a tool or a technology or a set of practices that supports and enables collective learning, publishing and exhibiting, and has been taken up already by various other publishing projects and groups. So the kind of collectively run, self-organized, open source and non-commodified platforms, infrastructures and, and frameworks that the project runs on and embodies as part of its ethos um, are, as part of its con contributors argue, a need. So there are a need to see these digital resources as occasions for building mutualism, collective learning and radical pedagogies on the terms of those who are invisible, vulnerable and discriminated against. So the processual publishing that the project enables serves various groups, contexts and needs, but its communal and crowdsourced character is also that what enables and builds solida solidarity and collectives. As Julian McCarty has argued in this respect, and I quote, the publication here is not merely a medium. Far from only allowing a collective to announce itself or to author its politics, the pu publication participates in articulating new collectivities, end of quote. In this sense, a pirate care syllabus and its flatten the curve, grow the care iteration can also be seen as a performative publication where they perform the forms of communal care and solidarity they argue for through their publishing processes, their infrastructures of knowledge sharing, and through the relationalities they weave around their publications in process. As part of their theoretical and practical interventions, these syllabi are exploring alternative forms of relational and distributed publishing. So this includes envisioning their publishing outlook and relationship towards the activist, artistic and scholarly communities they are embedded within as part of an ethics of care. So this project uh, showcases exceptionally well how the materiality or the form and the relationalities that the software and platform enable 
are an essential part and an agential force within the creation of the publication. So the last project I want to present here today is the Internet Archives National Emergency Library. So for those of you not familiar with the Internet Archives, this is a, a digital library which provides free access to its collection of digitized materials. As a non-profit activist organization, um, it's mostly involved in book scanning and digitizing, and you might also know it from the Wayback Machine, for example. So on March 24, 2020, in response to the closure of libraries, universities, schools and bookshops in the US and internationally as part of the first wave of global lockdowns, the Internet Archive announced that it would, and I quote, suspend waitlists for the 1.4 million and growing books in our lending library by creating a national emergency library to serve the nation's displaced learner, learners. This suspension will run through June 30, 2020 or the end of the US national emergency, whichever is later, end of quote. So the Internet Archive wrote that this national emergency library, which is a temporary collection of books to support remote teaching and research, was launched in response to calls from educators and librarians uh, to allow access to students and to people who cannot physically access their local libraries because of closure or self-quarantine. These resources in libraries paid for by taxpayers dollars were now locked away in libraries, no longer available to the public. So this was a situation that the Internet Archive felt it had the opportunity to and needed to intervene in. So what the Internet Archive did was actually to simply change the conditions of access to the works available in its open library, which consists of books it has scanned over the last 15 years, since it began partnering with libraries to scan the books in their collections. So normally the Internet Archives makes these available through so-called controlled digital lending, which is a service that offers a two-week loan of digital copies of books scanned from originals held in partner libraries. So this is an approach to digital ebook lending or provision, which manages or limits the amount of people who can access an ebook at one time through means of a waiting list. So in this sense, this principle operates similar to a bricks and mortar library, uh, mirroring its limited collection of physical print, uh, physical or print books. So the Internet Archive has upheld the principle of controlled digital lending over the last few years as a way to deal with publishers' concerns around their revenues uh, when these books would be openly available in the open library. But at the same time, through this principle, the Internet Archive has been testing the boundaries of copyright law. So it argues that the provision of public access to scanned in copyright works falls within the agreed legal framework as fair use or as an essential part of the service provisions of libraries. So the Internet Archive uses controlled digital lending in this sense as a technical and legal framework to support the Open Libraries project, Open Library project, while opening this further up through its creation of the National Emergency Library. So the Internet Archive further argued that this um, controlled digital lending framework would not be able to scale to respond to the global needs for knowledge and teaching resources that the pandemic would create. Hence, they felt that the creation of the National Emergency Library was a necessity. So responses to the la launch of the National Emergency Library were very mixed, as could be expected. Uh, so libraries were generally supportive, where the Internet Archive said it had support of more than 350 libraries and publishers. Um, lawyers debated whether the uh, National Emergency Library would fall under fair use or was a case of blatant copyright violation. Um, and many publishers, authors advocacy and copyright organizations were outraged about their perceived loss of income during the pandemic, declaring the Internet Archive's unilateral decision to open up its collections an infringement of their copyrights and a piratic act. In the end, four large publishers filed a lawsuit for copyright infringement against the Internet Archive, uh, which caused the Internet Archive to advance the closure date of the National Emergency Library to June 16th. So interesting enough, by fully opening up the open library beyond controlled digital lending, the Internet Archive not only provided access to its collections during a pandemic, which can already be seen as a specific publishing act or an act of making public in, in times of crisis, 
But it also further intervened in the debate around copyright and the role of the library in providing access to digitized works. So does the National Emergency Library and the principle of controlled digital lending fall under fair use or is it a violation of copyright law? So the argument could be made that the pandemic was an unprecedented event where the National Emergency Library was also time limited to coincide with the state of pandemic emergency. In addition to this, authors could opt out from having their books included in the library. But by making this a unilateral decision to open up its collections, instead of, for example, first discussing this option with the stakeholders involved or debating its merits further, the Internet Archive directly intervened as part of a rapid response to an emergency situation. So by doing this, it immediately opened itself up for litigation, but by broadening out the concept of controlled digital lending in this way, the Internet Archive might also have actually expanded it, justifying it as a temporary departure for, from generally operative copyright norms. But what makes this more complicated, also in a post-publishing context, is that this again also exemplifies how the functions and roles of libraries and publishers are increasingly blurring in a digital environment, and the Internet Archive is very much acting as a publisher through its making public of the materials in its collection, both by digitizing them through uh, and through its principle and practice of controlled digital lending, as well as through the launch of this National Emergency Library. And this blurring lines between lending and publishing in a digital environment, so beyond the perceived monetary loss and loss of usage data, is maybe what troubles publishers the most this kind of sense of loss of control. So this becomes clear from the responses from some of the university presses with books in the National Emergency Library, who were also making their books openly available on their platforms or were planning to do so at the same time. So after initially criticizing the effort, Duke University Press and UNC Press, for example, wrote, and I quote, we realized our two presses shared many of the same goals of the National Emergency Library, but we simply disagreed with the process by which the main goal was being achieved. So this is quite interesting, this idea that they wanted to stay in control of making those works openly available. So the National Emergency Library can be seen as a direct intervention in this context and pushing the boundaries of what the role of a library is in providing access to information in digital environment. And with that, speculating on a different future for libraries and our knowledge ecologies. So in this respect, I, I see the creation of the National Emergency Library as a form of experimental publishing or as a form of post-publishing. And this is actually where I wanted to end. So thank you very much. That was great. Thanks, Janneke. Um... God, there's, there's so much there to to think about and respond to. I uh, I I do. I, I mean, I, I want to to say, I, like, I know we've 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 a few minutes left within the hour, and and if, if people are happy to, I'd be I'd be you know happy to, to to go on a couple of minutes beyond if there are if there are questions and responses to go through. And um, so please uh, do feel free, uh, everyone in the audience, if you want to to add any questions to the chat at this point. Um, but I I mean I thought. You know, while people are thinking about it, I might I might just respond immediately. I think I, there's yeah I've taken lots of notes here, but but I'm really struck with the 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 kind of questions that are being proposed there in that last part of the, the presentation about this blurring of of lending and publishing, um, and what that entails for how we how we think about copyright. Well, I mean, it's you know if there are new precedents being set at this point in terms of what 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 can be categorized or, or legally defined as publishing, um, what are the ramifications for the, the power structures that, that sort of govern, um, that govern, that, that govern book production, that govern publication. I mean, I think it's one of, of several uh, moments at which this, this um, I guess this new terrain or this new landscape of, 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 uh, it's not to say it's deregulated, but it's there is a, a a kind of there's regulatory questions about how um, publishing is defined, and I find that I, I just think that that is it's it's it has repercussions for for all forms of knowledge at the moment. Um, so I just yeah I guess I'm 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 really curious on uh, on what you what you think is the 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 prospective outcome here. I mean I think a lot of what we're talking about 
uh, experimental publishing, uh, processual publishing, and so on, um, is is sort of setting itself up in in opposition to the the, the power structures as such as they exist. Uh, but obviously, there is pushback. There is there is going to be struggle. There's going to be um, uh, yeah. There 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 are there is there is I guess a struggle for legitimacy there. And I I, I suppose I just wonder what your feeling is about. You know what? What is the, the the future here, and is there is there a hope of shifting the kind of in, in, entrenched power of the, the scholarly publishers and the, the lit, you know the literary publishing world, the, the the worlds of publishing across the board? Really, sorry, I don't know if that question was very clear. I'm I'm, I'm very no, enthused. I, I get what you mean. I think it's 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 in general like um, for me, this is very much a political and an activist question. Like, how can we intervene, right? And then I think mm. that that's some of the most um, interesting experiments I think in publishing for me do exactly that so it, it's not only a critique or kind of a, a theoretical critique um, but through the publishing practices they're actually trying to create these new futures and new systems that we want to see right and, and and that's what gets me really excited for example and, and I always hope to be part of these kind of projects too um, and I that's exactly what I see uh, as the strength of experimental publishing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of definitions, of course, around experimental publishing, some more conceptually, but for me, that's what its strength is, that it has the potential to use publishing or making public as a way to intervene in the system of knowledge production. And of course, for me, I work with experimental publishing mostly within scholarly communication, but I think that we could broaden that out too in that sense. And I think that a lot of the kind of more uh, print-based forms that we still use within scholarly communication are also yeah reaching its limit in many ways there's, there's so many problems that are being created and, and things that we need to resolve in a way that we uh, create research in the way that we communicate it that we disseminate it and um so this is just it's asking us to respond at this point i think and i think the coming of a new medium always does that to some extent so it, it provides us an opportunity to respond and especially now we have a new medium we've got some time i feel or we have an opportunity to actually create something different uh, before the kind of uh, what you say established commercial and institutionalized forms um, again take over again so i, I see that we have or I hope that we have some kind of space to intervene there through mm. experimental forms of publishing. Okay. Thanks. Um, I can see that, and there are questions coming in that relate to, to what what we're what you're saying here. I mean, one uh, I can see Thomas has come in um, with a question to start: uh, What kinds of economies operate operate around the models you've described, and how do writers get get paid for their work in these contexts? Um, what would you say to to that? Well, uh, I mean, that's a good question because in the context that I work in, so in academia, uh, a lot of the idea is, of course, that scholars get paid through the university to publish, right? So they, they are salaried employees of universities. But of course, not all knowledge is created within institutions, right? So there is an issue there for um, uh for students, for uh, scholars working outside of institutions, for uh scholars from um, institutions that don't have that much money and especially at, the, at this point in time where for example where we want to publish in open access increasingly this is increasingly being mandated uh, and we're moving towards uh, models in which we have to pay to publish uh, and for a lot mm -hmm. of people this is not possible if you're not connected to an institution or if your institution doesn't have that kind of funding um, so it's a very complicated environment uh, and of course and this is something that we come back to a lot, I think, is that open publishing doesn't mean that it's free to create, right? So it still needs to be produced, it still needs to be copy edited, it still needs to be peer reviewed, it still needs mm. to be printed and, 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 and disseminated in that sense. And, and that costs a lot of time, effort and money. Um, but the way that I hope or my ideal system would be one in which... Um, based on open source infrastructure like the ones that I've discussed as part of the mm. Pirate Care project, um, we will be able to kind of 
share a lot of the costs and um, and the kind of technological capabilities needed uh, to do this work. Um, and I think there is a, a chance for us also to, if we again, and this is the more conceptual idea, if we start to see research more as part, or publishing more as part of the research process. So the moment we're outsourcing that uh, to commercial press presses, uh, uh, many most of the time and if we start to see it as actually part of the research process and something that we actually take responsibility for as scholars to create and in which our institutions see it as something that is worth funding um, that would be my ideal situation uh, to really bring this back into um, yeah into kind of a, a, a funded situation a public infrastructure in that sense yeah, important. yeah. um yeah, and I, I see that, that a little later, Tom, Tom came back in to mention the, the I mean, the, the question of universal basic income is something that's uh, currently being discussed um, in Ireland. There's talk of in introducing it for artists um, and that this might be a kind of, uh, I guess, a way of replicating something like a, a, a system where you we, we could conceive of this, this being taken out of a commercial realm. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, there's. There, I, I, I want to just touch on some of the other questions that are coming up here as well. I can see B asks, how does peer review work in this paradigm? Yes, well, that's that's a good question. I think one of the things that experimental publishing also does is reinvent what peer review is, right? Or what it can be um, and how we establish quality. Um, I mean, a lot of people within academia still think that the only way to establish quality is through double blind peer review, but this actually also has a lot of drawbacks, right? It's very hard to um, actually have a conversation with people mm. that are critiquing you. And I'm, I'm very much in favor personally of, of having an open communication uh, around research. And of course, again, this openness also creates problems of hierarchy and power structure. So there is no ideal structure, but um, so a lot of the projects that I've been working do with have been doing forms of open peer review. Um, so these can either be, um, so for example, using that software that I showed, Hypothesis, you can either just comment directly on a more experimental format online, um, or you can create groups of people so that would be uh, half closed um, that can, we'll be able to discuss. So you will be able to discuss with your peer reviewers, but the public won't see that. Um, so there's all kinds of in-between models to rethink what peer review could look like um, in a digital environment. Um, and yeah, I think lots of people are still experimenting with that too. So um, mm -hmm. we don't have an agreed on idea of what, and we never had, it's always been uh, different forms and ways of, of uh, yeah, assuring quality within different fields and uh, subjects. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think related to this, there's there's a couple of questions. Uh, I can see Una has written, um, uh, uh, among many other things, um, this raises so many questions uh, for me about the way in which academia has relied on power structures that control publishing and also contributes to those structures themselves. How do you navigate that as an academic? Um, and I think relatedly, B goes on to ask, has there been any major research into how the authors of academic papers themselves feel about the dislocating of gatekeepers from the publishing paradigm? I just thought I, that we, um, we, we could run those two questions together, maybe, to think about. Yeah, I think it, it's really hard. I mean, it, my argument is always, it, it, the, or the argument always tends to be that it should be the responsibility of senior academics to do things differently and to kind of pave the ground for um, for more junior researchers to to be able to do new things. But um, I actually think that the way publishing conditions us, right, even from the moment that we're a student, uh, forms and shapes us so much. So my argument is always that I think we should try to experiment with new forms um, mm from the start, right? So I don't know where that start would be when you're a student or when you're doing your PhD. Um, I feel that we have a responsibility to think through what kind of media we use. But of course, this is very complicated because we are also part of a system in which we have to publish and we have to publish in specific uh, places. Um, um, and we are also very much pushed by uh, our colleagues at the institution that we're in to publish in specific places. Um, but the good thing is that there are alternatives. And I think some of the projects that I've been highlighting and some of the collectors I've been highlighting um, have been uh, opening up these kind of spaces for people who want to do different things, different ways of publishing, want to do open publishing, who want to um, 
for whom the ethics of publishing uh, and the outlook of, uh, of of a publishing house are important too. Um, so it, it's, I, I mean, the way I personally do this or kind of navigate this landscape is by doing both. So um, I do experimental stuff that probably won't ever be recognized by any kind of uh, uh, metric. Uh, and on the, uh, on the other hand, I still publish in established. Uh, and I think this is a little bit what a lot of people are doing now. It's very hard to exist in institutions if you do not do that. Um, and so I don't have a perfect solution to how to navigate that. And I think the other question was the dislocating of gatekeepers from the publishing paradigm. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, in what sense that would be an issue in the sense that uh, if you look at, at publishers as the, the traditional gatekeepers. Um, so, and if you then look at, for example, communication via blogs or, or other kinds of, of non uh, peer reviewed or whatever quality assurance mechanism you use um, environments. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know of any specific research about uh, out of authors finding that problematic. Um, I think they just see it as an extra kind of environment where you can publish, but maybe I'm not completely understanding that question either. So, so sorry, B, if, I, <laughs> if I'm not completely answering that correctly. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I was really taken as well by what you, you the, the, um, the proposition of, of learning from artist books and the kind of experiments that were happening, as you say, in the, the 60s and 70s, that moment of, uh, a, again, a, a moment when the institution was being, um, uh, or there was a move away from institutional forms of of, uh, uh, of gatekeeping and control and the gallery and so on. And there was a kind of radical spirit that led to publishing as a kind of democratic alternative, maybe. Um, and I think that's a really rich proposition to apply within scholarly publishing. I mean, I think that that's that's something I'm going to, to take away and really think about because, um, uh, as you say, there is there is a moment for so much experiment and, and richness here. Um, uh, oh, and sorry, I see B has just come back there um, uh, to uh, just to, in, in answer um, if she, if there was any negative sentiment out there um, and and why um, um, if there's anything that isn't readily thought about. Um, which might be uncovered by some negative insights. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there are concerns, of course, uh, amongst academics, but I'm not one of those academics, I would say, but there are concerns about the quality, of course, of publications around um, misinformation, right? I mean, we all have that issue at the moment. Uh, like, how do you trust things that haven't been peer reviewed and that are just published by somebody um, online? But I think, again, in the kind of collaborative environments that um, yeah that, that, that I find interesting and that I uh, promote this is already kind of yeah diminished to some extent be because it's communities so there is actually already some kind of community review happening in a lot of these environments which um, which I see as a form of peer review in that sense um, but yeah I think that the main concerns there are around disinformation on the internet I would say and, and if we kind of uh, get away from traditional, gatekeeper mm -hmm. how do we then re-establish what what is mm -hmm. true or what is trustworthy or um and yeah that's an ongoing thing beyond scholarly communication i think that all media yeah. Have to, uh, have yeah and i would think i suppose i'd wonder as well about discipline and whether there's a, a sense of of a, a kind of threat to disciplinary organization or disciplinary boundaries that's inherent here i mean certainly the the kinds of work that we're, we're talking about do do naturally cross disciplines and and perhaps yeah i i mean i mean i, I do you know I, I i think um i think i've been guilty of it myself of setting up discipline as the enemy when actually most most scholars most most people within academia are agreed that discipline isn't isn't something to be um necessarily um uh um, uh, th 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 there isn't that that kind of rear guard action to protect discipline necessarily, um, but this is all, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, uh, these are all questions that could be that could be brought to bear, I suppose. Um, I mean, I guess we might, we yeah, we might finish. I, I at this point, I don't see any other questions coming in. I I think that was a really um, that was a, a 
a really fascinating conversation and chat. Um, I um, oh, I see there's one, maybe we have time for one last question um, from Julie, um, who says, uh, great presentation. I'm curious about using the term experimental to describe these publications. Um, I have read objections to describing forms of poetry as experimental as the term perhaps implies something that is contingent or not fully resolved. Do either of you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I actually think that there's nothing wrong with things being contingent or not fully resolved. And I would actually say that that's something that I think we should embrace much more. Uh, um, so I, I really like using, not talking about experimentation, but about experimenting or experimentation in, as a kind of a, a processual thing again. That um, so, so, so yeah, this idea that there is uncertainty, there is failure within publishing, uh, that's actually something that I think we shouldn't be shying away from, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's my main point, I think that's, uh, I can see it as something negative, maybe, uh, but yeah. I can I can understand that in poetry that is maybe seen, but I think because the experiment, of course, as, as a kind of scientific paradigm already has that element of trying out and testing uh, and critiquing in it, in that, in that sense, so that maybe it's more suitable in that context, too. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, yeah, I think even though everything you've been describing in terms of on, on fixity and, um, and, and processual, kind of processual and performative and experimental uh, nature, it's, 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 it's really about um, uh, in, it, it allowing or, or bringing that, that kind of unresolve into the equation, or, you know, um, moving away from uh, uh, maybe the, the fixed and finalized object um, as, a, as, a, as a way of organizing knowledge um yeah i mean i think yeah there's so much to think about there I, this has really been great thank you so much Janneke, and thanks everybody for for attending um and for for taking part in the in the conversation um i yeah we'll, we'll leave it there um thanks again to uh the the, the folks at, at minuth at, um uh Certainly to, to Una and to, to Tracy um, uh, in the background, who's who's uh, been really helpful in making these events happen. Um, I guess yeah, we'll 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 wrap it up at this point. The, the next event in the series will be coming up uh, on the twenty second of April, um, when we will have uh, Eva Weinmeier, who you mentioned, Janneke, um, whose work in this field, uh, both as theorists and practitioners, is really extraordinary. So I hope people can join and we can carry on and continue the conversation at that point. Um, but at this at this stage, I'll just say thanks again, Yannicka, and and uh, yeah, um, thanks for for tuning in, everyone.